Michael Moss is the Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter at the New York Times. He is the author of the New York Times best selling book, Sugar, Salt, Fat How the Food Giants Hooked Us. Michael, really a pleasure to talk to you. And there's just so much in your book that I was uh, very interested in. And I, I picked out a few things that I think might be interesting to focus on today. One that Great. I want to talk about is. When companies like Kraft and, and a lot of these other players that we're very familiar with in the processed food industry started to see study after study linking the uh, uh, sugar, salt, and fat-laden foods clearly to obesity, how did they react? Well, within these largest companies, there are actually, and this surprised me, cabals of insiders who became increasingly alarmed not just from like a social policy standpoint, but also just from fear of losing the public trust. And early on in my research for the book, I came across this extraordinary meeting way back in 1999. These insiders brought together the CEOs of some of the largest manufacturers in North America to talk about none other than the emerging obesity, diabetes, et cetera, epidemic. Um, and they stood up before these CEOs and made this incredible pitch. A senior official from Kraft gets up and armed with 114 slides, lays at their feet responsibility for the obesity crisis and, and even links their foods with several cancers and pleads with them to do the right thing by consumers. And what was the reaction to that pleading? You know, from his perspective, the meeting was an utter failure. I mean, he even went so far as to warn them that the lawyers who went after big tobacco, it wasn't just a matter of if, but when they were going to come after big food with the same arguments, that there are health effects from overconsumption of salt, sugar, fat, that the industry's over-reliance on these ingredients has contributed to the epidemic, and that the lawyers will come after that, if nothing else, to recover some of the public health care costs associated with obesity. The CEOs reacted defensively. They said, look, we already offer consumers of choice. We have in the grocery store products, versions of our mainline products that are low fat, low sugar, have added grains. We do respond to the consumers, but we're also beholden to shareholders. We must keep our prices low. We must make our food tasty in order to sell product. And which, which is basically a reaction that says, while we may understand the connection between our products and the diseases you're talking about, we also have a responsibility to shareholders, which pushes back against the social responsibility you're talking about. I mean, is that not essentially what, what that answer means? Yeah, I mean, I think there's essentially, too, also just a certain amount of denial when, when inside these companies. I spent time with the former president of Coca-Cola for North America, South America. And at one time, you know, at one point he said to me, look, Michael, you know, and by the way, he is now out there selling fresh carrots, doing what he calls karmic debt for the 20 years. He was one of Coke's fiercest warriors. And he said to me, look, Michael, you know, when you're inside the company in your day to day battle with competitors, in their case, Pepsi, you're just not sort of seeing the big picture, not wanting to see the big picture. So it's not as if these companies and their employees are evil empires intentionally setting out to, to get us overweight or otherwise ill. There are companies doing what companies do, which is make as much money as possible by selling as much product as possible. Talk a little bit about the bliss point. In the book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, you talk about the bliss point, and I think that that's a concept that would be interesting to our audience. I was really stunned at the amount of science, uh, they call it engineering, that goes into creating new foods. Bliss point is the term that the industry came up with to describe the perfect formula of sweetness in foods that would send us over the moon, guarantee high sales for them. A legend in the industry named Howard Moskowitz, trained in high math experimental psychology at Harvard, walked me through his recent creation of a new soda flavor for Dr. Pepper. And to achieve the bliss point, the perfect sort of formulation, he started with 61 different formulations of sweetness, each one just slightly different than the other, subjected those to 3,000 consumer taste tests, 
threw the data into his computer, did his high math regression analysis thing, and came up with a very perfect formula that would wow us and guarantee the company a hit. And when you and say, when you say, point, I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah. No, I was just going to say, and what's fascinating about sugar is that we don't have an endless desire for sugar. Anybody who drinks coffee and likes it sweet can do the experiment themselves. Just keep adding sugar till you get to the point where you really like it. Keep adding more, and you know, eventually you'll go, yuck, this is awful. So the bliss point typically is, is calculated. The data is on a chart that looks like a bell-shaped curve. We're at the very top of the, of the curve, not too little, not too much is the perfect amount of sugar and sweetness. So before we talk a little about the implications of that kind of uh, food engineering, the other fascinating thing in the book uh, of many is your salt story, right? This story about, well, when you look at the back of a can of soup or whatever it is, I'm always shocked by the amount of sodium that it has. And I say, why couldn't they just make the same product, but just put less salt in it? It'll be healthier. And will people really miss it if it's salty and not incredibly salty? But you actually know about why that doesn't work. I had the exact same question. And the answer is basically they are more hooked on salt than we are. And to demonstrate that for me, some of the largest companies, Kraft, Campbell Soup, and especially Kellogg made for me some of their icons without salt added. I went to Battle Creek, Michigan, research and development headquarters of Kellogg, and started tasting some of these icons with their people. And I'd have to tell you, it was the most god-awful experience I ever had. We started with the cheese, its crackers, which normally I could eat all day long. These we couldn't even swallow. They stuck to the roof of our mouth without salt. They lacked texture, solubility. The frozen waffles were even worse. We popped them in the toaster. They came out looking and tasting like straw. <laughs> and the clincher was the cornflakes. Put it in, you know, we put some put in the bowl with some milk and taste. And before it could say anything, the chief spokeswoman for the company got this look of a horror on her face and she swallowed and blurted out the word metal <laughs> m-e-t-a-l she i taste metal and the chief scientist is sitting there going yeah well that's one of the beauties of salt for us is that it will mask some of the off notes the bad flavors that can creep into some food processing so, th so is that really the source of this michael which is in, in everyday cooking, if you're using kind of whole ingredients, you don't need salt to cover the fact that the ingredients have been processed. Is that what, really why the salt is there? It's not to, as a preservative as we often hear. Right. Well, in fact, being a preservative is the other thing that it's incredibly useful to, too, is that when you cook for yourself, you don't need it. It doesn't have to sit in your refrigerator for two months at a right. time. I talked to a meat maker who actually has really low sodium salt in their products. I said, why? And they go, well, well actually, because we make our meat for the deli counter, not the, you know, not the grocery store aisle. So it has a you know, seven-day lifespan. So, yeah, preservative. The other you know, incredible, brilliant thing about salt to the industry, it's really low cost. Ten cents a pound. They can use it to avoid using more costly ingredients like fresh herbs and spices. Last thing, and we don't have too much time here, which I'm, I'm curious to get your take on, is have using have, has the consumption of these processed foods, which have so much salt and these uh, finely tuned uh, bliss points of sugar, has this kind of changed the standard of people's palates and how normal food is judged such that it's completely skewing our perception of what food is? Oh, absolutely. And scientists, even within the food industry, are alarmed at the way, for example, sweetness has become, has migrated through the grocery store, out of the dessert aisle, through the rest of the store, and is teaching kids to expect sweetness in almost everything. Bread is now sweet. You know, yogurt can have as much sugar in it as ice cream. Pasta sauces can have the equivalent of a couple of Oreo cookies in a half cup serving of pasta sauce. And that sort of, especially with sugar, but also fat and salt, sort of the, the extent to which the processed food industry has helped shape our desire for and our expectation for large amounts of these three ingredients is part of the issue that the public health system is now struggling with. Well, the book, once again, is Sugar, Salt, Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. We've been speaking with the book's author, Michael Moss. Really great to have you on. Fascinating. I, I encourage our audience to check out the book. Thanks for having me.